Hey everybody, we are live. We're gonna do a full tour of the trailer here today. And this is some, a video that people have been asking me for for a while. I finally decided, hey, it's probably about time. I've made enough changes since I built it, and it probably makes a little bit of sense to actually spend some time giving a, another grand tour. So this is set up where uh, you'll be able to ask questions during the, during the stream. So if you have a question, leave it in the comments section down below. I've got monitors set up around the trailer where I can actually view those. And uh, so uh, if you have a question, be sure and ask it. So I've got uh, Witty Film Girl here helping me today. She's going to be following me around the trailer and uh, just shooting what we're talking about. So uh, I think we're probably going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to start here in the front and kind of work my way around to the back. So with that, let me switch cameras. There we go. And we'll go. Aaron, happy birthday. This is just for you, right? Just kidding. All right, so in the front, we have the technical director desk. And this also uh, doubles as the desk for the director. Uh, we have a computer set up here just, just for the technical director. And I'm running the ATEM software on the touch screen over here. And also have an X keys controller that I can also use to control the switcher as well. Uh, this is connected through the Just Macros software. I know that's kind of hard to get a hold of these days. The website's kind of messed up at the moment. I'm still using Just Macros for now. Eventually, at some point, I will be doing my own software when I don't have a thousand other projects going on. But uh, So this is a Surface Pro 2. It's kind of an older computer, but it was inexpensive. And one of the main reasons I went with this is it actually runs off of 12 volt power. So throughout the trailer, I actually have a ton of devices that are running on 12 volts. And that allows me to, for example, power them off of solar. I have 400 watts of solar panels on the roof. And I've got a controller here to let me see what's going on. This is actually a pretty recent addition. And right now, for example, it's generating 293 watts off of the solar panels. So during the daytime when the sun's out, a significant portion of the tra uh, power that I use in the trailer actually does come from solar. So um, obviously when the sun's not out, that means all the power is coming from AC. But uh, yeah, it's nice to have the solar as an option. It's also uh, nice when I'm away from power. The, the solar panels can actually keep the some of the core systems of the trailer running. So some of the networking and the security systems and some of those other things, they can actually run exclusively off of solar power. So if I was to have to park the trailer somewhere for some extended period of time for whatever reason, the solar panels would be enough to keep those, those important systems running all the time. So uh, looks like we've got some viewers from all around the world. We've got Sweden, we've got London, Dallas, Texas. Texas is my home state, by the way. I don't know if I've mentioned that on camera. I'm actually from Houston, so. All right, so um, while I'm also talking about power, I mentioned that I have a inverter charger from Xantrex. This is a 2,000 watt unit, and it's hooked up to two AGM batteries that are uh, providing up to 200 amp hours uh, of, of current, uh, which means that I can run the trailer on battery for about an hour, roughly an hour. So with everything in the trailer running, it consumes a little over 1,100 watts. Uh, so, yeah, with the batteries I've got, I can run for about an hour. And if I, of course, of course, if I got solar at the same time, that would that mean would mean it would go a little bit longer. Uh, but having the uh, inverter charger and, and solar means that I've got some a pretty good backup system for power in case the we're, we're at a venue and the power happens to go out. And for me to turn on the battery backup, all I really have to do is hit this button up here, and then we're good to go. So that's come in handy a number of times. Very often, we're, I'm finding that when I go into a venue and ask uh, for dedicated outlet, dedicated circuits on their power system, they don't know what I'm talking about. And so they just have me plug in some random place, and inevitably we end up tri tripping a breaker because there's something else on the circuit, and we push past the 15 or 20 amp limit that's on those on those circuits. So uh, it's having the battery backup has actually been pretty pretty nice and pretty critical for some of the venues that we happen to work with just because they're not familiar with the power requirements. And I should mention when I'm talking about power that I, I specifically designed this trailer with the idea of being able to run on household electrical outlets. Uh, as I was building, an, in addition to having my monetary budget, I also had a power budget. So as I was selecting components, I had a spreadsheet I was keeping track 
what's the maximum power draw of this piece of equipment. And so I was making sure that everything in the trailer would come under 1500 watts. I wanted to make sure that I could for sure run on a 15 amp circuit somewhere. Uh, air conditioner excluded. That, that alone uh, requires an entire dedicated circuit just for that. But all the electronics happen to run on a single circuit. So, um, so I've got a question from Jamie. When you have time, can you tell me what's the best SDI cable for 150 foot and how to convert the cam from HDMI to SDI? I have a video here on the channel about converting. And in terms of best cable, uh, the one I would recommend is going to be like a Belden 1694A if you're running high def. Uh, if you're running uh, uh, ultra high def, then we need to get into a whole other class of product, and I can't remember the model number off the top of my head. So, and we've got also another hello from Germany, Bavaria region. Okay, cool. It's awesome to have such an international audience. Okay, all right. So, um, now front monitor wall. So I've got two 43-inch monitors. These are from Vizio. They're actually what they call a home theater display. Uh, which means they're not really TVs and they're not really computer monitors. They actually do have a pretty decent picture for being LCDs. Uh, not amazing, but uh, they're, they're okay. And most of the time for productions, I will do preview on the left and then program on the right, uh, although that does change. One of the nice things about having the trailer set up the way that I do is I can send any signal from any source to any monitor, which means I can move the different positions around um, quite a bit and we do that quite a bit as well so um, also uh, on the front wall we have three 27 inch LG monitors and I should mention that nearly all of the monitors in the trailer are 4k and I tried to go with wide gamut ones where I could um, but these uh, from, from LG have a five millisecond response and so there's very 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 little delay from the incoming signal to the time it's actually displayed and if I wave my hand, you can see that there's a little bit of delay, but it's not too bad. So the combined delay between the camera, switcher, and monitors, it's, it's actually not too bad at all. Which is really, really nice when you're dealing with things that are time critical, like music, where you want to cut to the beat of the music. Um, it, having a display that's really, and that has very little latency, is, is uh, kind of critical, kind of important. So, All right, I have a question here asking me to run through the X keys setup. So. Maybe we can come a little closer here, Wit, and talk about this. So this is the X Keys 128 controller, and it's a layout that I designed. I've got uh, the first ME for my switcher on the bottom four rows, and the second ME on the fifth row. The blue buttons are for preview, red buttons are for program. I've got my cut and and dissolve buttons or auto button over here, and then I've got a few buttons for setting the duration of the transition and selecting the type of transition there as well. The top couple rows are for doing upstream, downstream keys for the most part. Then I have 12 buttons which are intended for macros. Uh, I'm only using a handful of those, and those mostly for the uh, super source transitions that I demonstrated on my channel a few months back. Uh, so go look for that video if that's something that interests you. So I can actually choose the layout for my super source and do animated transitions between those. So you can have to go from a layout with two cameras on screen to three cameras on screen and actually have it animate as, uh, as well. So, but yeah, so that's, this is actually my main control for controlling the switcher. I, I had looked into possibly doing one of the, the two ME ones from Blackmagic, and the main reason I haven't do that, done that is just cost. This front desk of the trailer was actually uh, designed with the proper dimensions to have that as well as place for space for a laptop on the desk as well. So eventually, you know, if I do happen to get wealthy, I may invest in one of those. So, okay, uh, let's see a question. Can you tell me the best software for Bible and song projection as a feature to import anything? I don't know. Uh, I actually wrote my own software for, for that particular purpose. So I'm, I've never even looked at the different options that are out there, unfortunately, so. Okay, so. Ainsley asking, do you have an instant replay for broadcasting sports? Kind of. So this desk down here, and we'll have to step back just a bit, but this desk here is actually designed for instant replay. So the monitor, um, it's not showing it now, but the monitor is set up to show four cameras and then the four, and four instant replay versions of those cameras. So you can view both the live and the playback at the same time, and then also see the program feed. Um, 
I haven't finished the software to make that happen. I'm writing my own software for a lot of the stuff here in the trailer. But uh, I have not done finish the software on that because we haven't done a sporting event that, that needs that for some time. Uh, eventually when we do, I will finish that. But uh, So this desk is designed specifically for that purpose. And normally when we were, would be doing that, we'd have this controller. This is a sh uh, shuttle from Contour. And this would be used to control the, the playback of those cameras. So you'd use these buttons to toggle which cameras you control. Frame of frame reverse, uh, speed up, sl uh, slow down on there. So that's kind of the gist of it. Uh, when I do that, I'll probably be using HyperDeck Studio uh, minis, but I'm open to other solutions as well. Okay, so Hand of Fear. How much stowing of equipment like the x do you have to do? Why no Volker on the desk for stuff like that? Um, when I first built the trailer, I was very, very religious about securing everything and over time I've just found that things really don't move around very much so the only things that I've ever seen come off the desks are the mice and so all the mice do have velcro on them and I just stick them on these little velcro pads that I have around the trailer and that keeps them in, in place uh, some of the more expensive stuff like my audio mixer if I'm moving more than a few blocks I will strap that down but for the most part I haven't had to do much some of these monitors that swing away from the wall do have locks in place. So as I pull down on the chain here, I should release it. There we go. Yeah, and so I can, I can move that away, move that around, uh, pull it away from the wall, and so forth. So I think the uh, computer went to sleep the same time I did that. Anyway, so I have two monitors that, are, that have locks like that. The other monitors are pretty much fixed in place. Um, so haven't had to worry about that. Uh, other questions. I was to mention, let's see, Kayla mentions that Casper CG works as well for, for graphics. Yes, it does. So it has kind of a steep learning curve, but it does work for producing graphics as well. So um, Andrew Tay mentions that 3Play would be the cheapest real replay deck. Yeah, it, so 3Play is fine. I, I wanted a solution that could do 4K, and the 3Play does not. So. Uh, the next solution would be probably vmix with vmix you can do instant replay so all right so king mb asking what software do i use for editing videos um almost exclusively premiere uh, i've been using premiere for 25 years i know it quite well um i've never even tried final cut to be honest i'm actually more of a windows guy uh even though you see that there's a macbook here but uh i've Dinked around a little bit with uh, with Resolve, but I'm really primarily a, a Premiere user. So Ainsley asking if I've ever used NDI. I have not. Um, I've kind of explained that in some of my other videos. The NDI just doesn't really make sense in my situation because my switcher doesn't support it. And if you don't have a switcher that supports NDI, then it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Okay. All right. Um, let's move back to the front desk a little bit and talk about some of the other things that are going on here. So I've got, got an audio mixer here, and this actually brings in sources from all over the trailer. It's connected to several other monitors here, so any of the video that's coming to one of these monitors, I can take the audio and play it through the Sony soundbar that's here. Um, also has a direct connection to the audio mixer in the back, and it also has a connection to the two-way radio, which is over here. So it's a GMRS radio, uh, 5 watts of power. It has I've communicated over 10 miles away with that radio, so it has pretty pretty good range. Uh, but but yeah, so all those sources, uh, intercom goes, comes through there. All those sources get mixed with the audio mixer, and then comes to the sound bar here, which uh, is nice for anybody who's not wearing a headset in the trailer at the time. I I always turn it on even if I'm the only one in the trailer, because that way if I need to step away from the desk and pull off my headset, I can still hear the audio. I've actually been really impressed with the quality of the sound bar. Uh, it's one I picked up ultra, ultra cheap many, many years ago, but it sounds pretty good. And then there's a subwoofer for it behind the wall, and so it actually produces a pretty good quality sound with decent bass. Underneath the audio mixer, we have just an I.O. panel. Let me uh, try and move this out of the way here. So connections for the Surface, which includes power, USB, HDMI. Uh, there's uh, additional USB connections, which are where I plug in the X keys. 
uh, VNC connectors for SDI connections. I have those kind of throughout the trailer. And then connections for the intercom, which includes a switch to mute the mic. So I can leave it on all the time, turn it off, or press down to just temporarily turn it on. And then when you release, it shuts off again. So really handy if you have to cough or make noise of some kind. And a similar setup in the middle, although this one adds some audio connections from the, from the mixer in the back. So if I need to send audio to or from the mixer up to the front desk, I can do that. Uh, also a switch for turning the task lighting on and off. There's one there and another one over here as well. So each one of the desks has ta dedicated task lighting. Speaking of lighting, I'm going to kill the YouTube lighting and we'll just go uh, if we can actually see. Maybe not. Pretty dark. Okay, all right. I'll turn, we'll turn it back on. All right, so, um, so yeah, there's dedicated task lighting, which is what we normally use when we're producing. And those lights are 5600 Kelvin, so close to the same color temperature as the monitors, which is nice when you're trying to judge color when you're looking at if your lighting is the same color as your screen. It makes it a little easier to see uh, if see the colors, colors in an accurate fashion. So, um, what else should I mention here? Oh, I just recently added some USB connections for um, the server, like went in the computer server that I have here in the trailer the other day. So I, I never designed this trailer with video editing in mind. I always intended to use a computer that I have in my office for that purpose. And I've got a really beefy computer that's, that's really good at editing. But there, I found that there are times when we actually needed to do editing here. And so over time, I've kind of morphed the trailer a little bit to accommodate that a little better. And that's one of the things that I did. So you can plug in devices like the Contour Shuttle um, or USB thumb drives or whatever right here at the front desk, even though the computer you're plugging into is all the way in the back. So, but uh, it's, it makes for a pretty nice editing facility. Um, the two bottom monitors become the computer displays, and the bottom right becomes the display for the actual video that you're editing. Um, while we're in that mode, we also send the video that we're editing up to this upper left monitor. You can, don't necessarily always turn it on, but I've got this set up where any, whatever's on this upper left monitor also goes to my scopes over here. So this is the Blackmagic Design Smart Scope Duo. And so I've got this set up with a YUV Parade and then um, a vector, sorry, uh, not vector scope. Um, yeah, vector scope. Um, so we can make sure that our, all of our colors and everything and, and exposures are all, pro are all correct. So, um, let's see. One other little interesting thing here is within the last few months I added a little unit here to monitor the 12 volt power systems in the trailer. I, I do intend to do a lot more monitoring of the the power that's being used and generated within the trailer. So right now, the 12 volt system is currently at 13.26 volts and drawing 22 amps. So I kind of keep an eye, idea on what's going on there. Eventually, I will have monitors all over the place. I just haven't gotten there quite yet. Um, another thing worth mentioning here is the master clock. Uh, you guys who followed the channel would know that it actually used to be up top. And I moved it down here a few weeks ago in anticipation of building another shelf for the top above above the monitors here. One of the big issues with the, the trailer has always been having enough storage. And so I'm always looking for new ways to build additional storage for the trailer. So I'll build another shelf up there and then I'll be able to hold more of these gray bins that you see up here. I've got several more of those than are than are up there and more than I can fit you know, fit neatly inside the trailer. So at some point I will be building uh, another shelf to go up there. Okay, let's see, any decent questions here? Uh, yeah, the Resolve is designed for conforming color. It's weird when people use it for primary editing. They've added a lot of editing features in the last couple of years, and so it actually makes a, a decent editing. Uh, it just got a strange workflow if you're used to something like Premiere or Final Cut. It, it operates quite differently. The nice thing about Resolve is they have a free version. Uh, it's missing some features, but you, can, you get all the basic editing in there as well. So. Uh, someone asking how old is DJP? DJP as a company was formed in 2016. Um, I've been doing video production of some sort 
off and on for 25 plus years. Uh, so even though this business is new, my crew and I have been doing this for a long time. So not, not too terribly new. How much did the setup for all the things cost? So I've never sat down to add it up. Um, I think the cost of the trailer is somewhere between one hundred seventy and two hundred thousand dollars. It's somewhere in that ballpark. I've, ne I've never added it up, but that's, I think it's somewhere in that in that range. So, if you don't mind telling us the total budget for the trailer, there, yeah, I just answered that. So, did you paint that shit a little gray, or they sell them that way? It's actually silver, and it's it's original color except for <laughs> where I dropped something on it and scratched it pretty badly. But it's, it's that's the original shuttle. It's not the shuttle two, which they currently sell. I've had that for. 15 plus years so um okay um also thing other thing worth mentioning here in the front is the telephone um this works even when the trailer is in motion uh it has the trailer has a dedicated phone line there are actually three phones in the trailer they can call pretty much anywhere in the world they can re receive incoming calls uh, i'm not going to give out that number sorry um but they can also call each other and in one case, I can actually tie it into the intercom system. So if we're dealing with a situation where we've got a camera operator that's really far away from the trailer, uh, we can actually use phones to communicate intercom with them. So, OK, what's the height inside the trailer? And trailers generally this higher to depend. So interior dimensions on the trailer, it's 7 feet tall, 7 feet wide, and a total of 16 feet long. It's actually a little longer than that. 16 feet is basically this front wall to the very back. And in front of this wall, it's actually the V-nose, and that's where all the power systems for the trailer are. So if you were to measure from this wall to the actual front of the trailer, it's another two feet beyond that. And then beyond that, there's another two feet on the, on the tongue. So front to back, the trailer is actually about 20 feet, which happens to match the dimensions of a standard parking space almost exactly. And that's one of the reasons that I picked the size of trailer. This trailer actually does fit in a standard parking space without any issue. So there's a lot of facilities where anything bigger just wouldn't work you know they just don't have a place to put it and so this size of trailer was actually just perfect for that um, normally trailers like this the normal normally they come in six or six and a half feet heights i did have to uh, have it custom made in order to get the seven feet height uh, i also had it custom made to get all the insulation and the air conditioner normally you don't find air conditioners in trailers like this but uh so yeah, so my requirement, my special requirements were additional height, air conditioner, insulation, and then a they call it a fuel door, but I actually use it for for doing cables. So getting cables in and out of the trailer, it's my cable hatch. So uh, because it was custom made, it took uh, three months to get it done instead of just picking one up at the lot. So from the time I ordered it to the time I picked it up was just under three, or just over three months. So any other questions here? Wow. Uh, okay. What, kind, what do you use to reach high quality video with less megabytes? So right now, I mean, we're just encoding with MPEG-4, so nothing too special there. Uh, I've considered going to MPEG-5, but HEVC, but hardly anybody supports that yet. Um, bandwidth has never been too much of a problem. The, the, the trailer actually has a pretty decent cellular connection in it, so it's kind of a higher end radio than you get in your typical cell phone. So a lot of times when my cell phone only gets 15 megabits per second, my trailer gets 30 megabits per second. Uh, and it also will bond, they don't call it bonding, but it's like bonding, two separate channels within a given carrier. Most of the time I use T-Mobile as my carrier here in the trailer, but with that bonding feature, 30 megabits per second is actually pretty common. Uh, I try not to use the cellular in the trailer, except as a backup, but when I need it, it's here, and that provides plenty of bandwidth for streaming even high quality 1080p. So that hasn't really been much of a concern. OK, how, how, has any equipment gotten obsolete since build? I wouldn't say obsolete. I mean, when I built the trailer, I was kind of looking forward anyway. So I, everything in the trailer supports 4K, um, where 4K equipment is available. There are a couple exceptions where, where it's not. But uh, for the most part, I haven't had to retire anything because it's obsolete. I've done a number of upgrades to get something that's a little nicer, but, I'm not, but I haven't had to retire anything because it's obsolete. All right, there's a couple people asking what Xbox controller is for. So this Xbox controller is actually for an Xbox. There's an Xbox down here under the front. 
It doesn't get used very often, but there are times when we have a, a lot of downtime during an event, and it's nice to have some entertainment. Uh, so not only, not only for games, but it's also used for playing movies and that kind of thing. So again, it doesn't get used often, but it's there just in case. And while we're talking about what's under the desk, maybe we ought to take a look at some of these other things. So next to the Xbox, uh, Xbox there is my main fiber reel. So this is a new one that I did a video about a little over a month ago. Uh, this is 150 meters, has 24 strands of fiber, which means I can support about 15 plus cameras over that. It also carries audio over Ethernet and inter our internet connection and everything else. So um, bi-directional communication with each of the cameras, um, ether high-speed Ethernet. So yeah, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty nice to have all that with a single connector that just pops in and good to go. Um, we can kind of ignore that box. That's just parts for upgrades that I'm doing. And then most of the rest of the stuff there is just camera storage. So I found that this is a good place to store cameras. During an event, we pull them out. And so that, that space empties out during an event. Um, although when we're working in a trailer, they can get a little kind of frustrating to have them underfoot. But uh, and so that's, where, that's where the bulk of the cameras are actually stored there under the desk. Um, don't need it anymore, but there's also a space heater there. During the winter, that space heater keeps the interior of the trailer at above 45 degrees Fahrenheit. That way, I don't have to worry about batteries freezing or anything like that. So, um, But for the most part, the trailer uh, generates enough heat with the electronics that during an event, you never need the, the heater. Okay, so... Um, so Aaron asking about customizations of the trailer itself. So, okay, asking about the suspension. So the suspension is, uh, what do they call that, torsion spring? It's uh, dual axle and torsion springs, and it's pretty smooth. So the trailer just really doesn't move around much. Works pretty well. Um, Aaron Robertson asking if I have any B-roll footage uh, in the trailer as use in an event. We have a little. If you search the, the channel here, the YouTube channel, you'll find that there actually are some videos about that. Some of them I've taken down just because I don't want to pollute the channel with a whole bunch of that stuff. Um, if you can't find something that you like, let me know and I'll get you a, uh, a link to, to view one of those. Uh, over half the videos on this channel are actually hidden, so I have a lot more, more material out there than what you can actually see. Okay, so Brandon asking how I can uh, tie the VOIP phones in the intercom system. So it's actually just an analog connection. So on one of the phones, I plug into the headset jack, and then that I use a couple of uh, transformers to connect it into, um, at this point, a Dante interface, actually. So, so the intercom audio, uh, the telephone audio is able to interface, interface through the intercom using Dante. All right, uh, what equipment do I, use, where do I use for cellular connections? So I use a, it's a modem router from MoFi Network out of Canada. Uh, I, I will do a video about that at some point. I've just been too lazy to, to pull it out of the back of the trailer. It's, it's mounted kind of permanently, so I haven't had the desire to, to pull it down, but, but I, could, I could do that at some point. So. Okay, how are the screens attached to the front wall? So I use just kind of your off-the-shelf monitor mounts for for all these monitors, nothing special there. Uh, I actually went with some kind of cheap ones, to be honest, so they were only a few bucks a piece, but they work well, so uh, yeah, they hold the monitors in place and um, they do what they're supposed to do, so. Okay, can you use link aggregation to tie cellular connections to conven conventional ethernet? Uh, not with the networking equipment itself. If you want to aggregate conne connections, you kind of have to do it through whatever video provider you happen to be using, so, I'm still using Teradek ShareLink, uh, although I find it, I n almost never have to do aggregation with that. I almost always have sufficient bandwidth through the venue or through my cellular connection, um, but it is out there. It's an option if I need it. I mostly just don't use it because I have to pay for the, for the bandwidth on that, whereas I don't for everything else. So. What resolution frame rate is the multi-view outputting to display on the 4K monitors? All right, so the Blackmagic multi-view itself actually only does 1080i, and that's what you're seeing here. So those are actually 1080i signals. Uh, when we get to the server rack, or the equipment rack in the back, I'll show the other multi-views that I have, and they actually do output 4K. So like this monitor that's up here, that's dis that is displaying 
a 4K signal. So each of the four quadrants is a full 1080p resolution on that one. But for the multi-views from the switcher, those are just 1080i. Okay, what kind of router setup do I have? I'll talk about that when I get to the equipment rack in the back. Let's see, alternative to talk show VS4000. Uh, I'd have to research that, I'm not sure. What is the hardware on top of the printer? Okay, so this is one of the Blackmagic Design Studio converters. These are the fiber units, fiber conversion units that I use. So if you haven't seen one, you have fiber connections from two and from the cameras, and then it has, uh, I can get that back in, an SDI video output and then audio outputs for each of the four channels. It also provides intercom, uh, so it's bi-directional video, intercom, tally, uh, all that through, through one unit. And this does work. Uh, I intend to put this in my fly pack for my smaller switcher. I just haven't done it yet. So it's just sitting here waiting to be installed. So, okay. Okay, what cameras do I use for events? All right, so I'll actually pull one out here. My camera of choice is, for most events, the Sony PXW-Z150. These are 4K cameras. Um, has a one inch sensor, so for a camcorder it's absolutely huge, which means that it gathers a lot of light. And if I need to, I can zoom in and kind of get a little bit of a shallow depth of field with it. Although for live, that's not necessarily always the most desirable thing. Uh, I like the camera because it actually has a, a really, really good image, and it's um, these things have been been great. Um, 12x optical zoom, and it has Sony's clear image zoom to take it out to 18 times when you're shooting in uh, 4K, and 24 times when you're shooting HD. And I haven't had very many situations where this camera has not met my needs very, very well. Um, I have three of this, and then. I have a, a, one of its sister models, which is actually what we're shooting on here today. It's the Sony PXW uh, X70. So those are kind of my four main cameras. And then I have another company that I work with uh, fairly often that has an additional three Z150. So if I ever need additional cameras, I just make one phone call and I can have the cameras right away. Uh, we also have some Sony PTZ cameras, the SRG 300 SE. I have a Blackmagic Ursa Mini, although I find that doesn't work super well uh, for live work. Uh, and then I have, there's a shoulder mount Sony Cheapo camera. It's under the desk here. Uh, it's M MC 2500, I think is the model number. And then I use Sony X3000 action cameras. So. I try to stick with a single manufacturer most of the time. That way the, the colors look similar between cameras. Although, if I need to color match, I can certainly do that as well. So I have a, a number of Blackmagic Design Terranex Mini SDI to HDMI converters available, and I can drop a lot into those. And if you look on this channel, I pr produced a video a while back about how to do color matching, how to create a what to make two colors match. I have a, a website that I created specifically for that purpose. So. That's what I use most of the time. There are other times when we've brought other cameras in, but that's kind of the, the ones that we use most commonly. I'm pretty happy with them. Okay, redo the shading work, work through. I don't really have shading much um, here in the camera in the trailer. So for the most part, we, we start by white balancing the cameras, and we haven't done this very often, but when we need to tweak the colors a little bit, we'll use those Terranex minis to apply a lot to the video. So it works, works okay. I would love to have a proper camera chain with uh, CCU and everything, but at this segment of the market, the budget segment, that's just kind of outside the realm of possibility. I would have spent more on two cameras than I would have spent on the whole trailer if I'd gone down that route, so. All right, let's see. You also do work for television stations providing SDI or other signals. Uh, I, I've never broadcast directly to television, uh, television station, but we have provided footage to television stations a few times. So we have a community event that we do on the 4th of July every year, and we've had one of the local television stations take footage from that. There was uh, a conference that I shot a few months back 
where the local ABC affiliate wanted copies of the footage, but I've never had to interface directly with with a, a broadcast. Um, I have a Terranex Express converter in the back, so I had to down convert to 1080p or 10, sorry to 1080i or 720p if need be, but I haven't haven't had to directly work with broadcasts in her real time. Okay. Gen which ATEM switcher are you using? I'm using the 2ME Production Studio 4K. I'll show that more when we get back to the, the rack. How do I originally get into live VR production? How do you build a relationship with your clients? So I've been interested in video since I was a little kid. And when I saw kind of bits and pieces uh, on TV about how they produce television shows, I thought it was really interesting. Um, I kind of started out by doing your more conventional shoot, edit workflow and discovered pretty early on that I don't like editing very much. And so I decided that I was going to do more of the live thing. So it's still kind of editing, but it's done on the fly. So as soon as the event's over, you're, you don't necessarily have much editing to do. So that's kind of, kind of what drove me to that. And as soon as I could start affording the equipment, I started buying it. This would have been late 90s, early 2000s. And I started buying up the equipment to, to do that. So obviously in those days, it was all standard def. And I kind of worked with that equipment for several years and then... I had a software job. My day job is actually as a software developer, so video is not my full-time gig. Um, but I had a software gig that was taking up 18 hours a day, and so I didn't have much time for video, so I kind of got put on hold for a little while. And then in 2016, I quit that job, and decided I wanted to get back into video again. So that's when I bought up, started buying up all new equipment again. So and I knew that 4K was, a com was something that was coming, so I just kind of went straight from standard def to 4K and sort of skipped high def uh, for live production entirely. I had, I'd had high def cameras before, but I didn't do live production with those. So, okay, let's see. When you cut to your computer on your videos, you have a piece of software called PTZ Stick. What hardware interface to use for the cameras? So that's for my Sony PTZ cameras, uh, the Sony SRG300 SEs. They have e Ethernet, so I just plug in an Ethernet cable and then the software communicates directly over a TCP, it's actually a UDP connection uh, to those cameras. So nothing fancy, nothing, no proprietary hardware involved in that. Awesome guy asking if I use CCUs on my Sony cameras. No, they don't support it. The cameras I have don't support that. I would love to, I just can't afford it. Okay, use cameras with reference. No, I do not. Um, so people who are unfamiliar with that is basically gen, gen locking. Uh, the cameras I have, most of the cameras I have do not do gen locking. It hasn't really been much of an issue, to be honest. I mean, the total delay from light going in the camera to coming out of the switcher is just over a frame, and that's um, so little that most people don't notice it. So it's never really been an issue. I would love to again, but again, cameras are too expensive. So, all right, see tripods. Okay, all right, yeah. So we can we can actually get to tripods because that's kind of sort of the next step. So my main tripod that I, it's kind of the first one I set up for every event. This is a Sackler. I wish I had Sacklers for all my cameras, but, but this is, it's an FSB 10. And it's, it's got a, a spreader on it and everything. Um, very, very smooth. I really like this, this head quite a bit. Um, downside to these is cost. This tripod was over $3,000, like $3,300. So when you're buying four, six uh, or six of them, you try to find ways to save some money. So most of my other tripods are actually Manfrotto. And I can pull one of those out here as well. No, this is a ball head. And one of the downsides of the ball head is they don't have a telescoping pull at the top so you're a little bit limited in height and there are definitely times when I need a little, a little additional height than what this camera can do or what this tripod can do so there's my there we go so this is one of my main Man Manfrotto's that cases have seen better days uh, this is a tripod I've had for oh my gosh 15 years and then I put a newer head on it a few years ago so um, the, uh, these legs will actually extend up 12, up to 12 feet. 
so I can get the camera over 12 feet in the air with this thing. And let's, what's the model number on this? This is the 3246. And then I have, this blade's called the HD201. I forget. Um, head. These aren't the best, but they're good enough. And so I've got a pile of those. I think I have like five or six of those guys. Um, they work. They work well enough. So, again, it would be nice to have sacklers for every camera, but unfortunately, not really an option. All right, I'll deal with that later. <laughs> Get that out of the way. Right. So, tripod storage since it's kind of under the desk here. All right. Uh, let's see. My device to use to sync audio and video. I haven't had to worry about that too much. The cameras that I use have so little latency coming out that I don't have to worry. I haven't really had to worry about delaying the audio in order to get good lip sync. Like the the audio you're hearing right now, there's no delay on that. So if it looks like my lips are in sync, then then yeah, uh, working without delay works just fine. So. Hasn't really been much of an issue. I know there's some cameras out there where that's really been a problem, but with the cameras that I use, it's really not. Can you explain how to feed audio in your Blackmagic Studio converters? I will cover that when I get back to the equipment rack, so I am having to do that. When is converter SDI to analog? Uh, Blackmagic make one that I use. I don't use it often, but there are times when I have to interface into uh, an old standard def video system, and I'll use a converge for that. All right, you tell, us, tell us more about software development job. Well, I've, had, <laughs> I've been doing software development professionally for 35 years at this point. Um, I started writing software back when I was just four years old, and I got my first professional programming job at 11, and I've just kind of been doing it ever since, and I've worked in pretty much every industry out there. I'm currently working for a biotech company. I'm also designing a point of sale system for a jewelry store. Of course, I have my crew access website that I've created. And then I've got a bunch of other software that I do just for the fun of it. So most days, I'll, I'm in front of the computer 16 hours writing code. Um, probably the most visible thing I've ever done is the point of, sale, point of sale system for Little Caesars restaurants. So if you go into Little Caesars restaurant, that's my software that's running those stores. Uh, so I did not just the point of sale, but the overwhelming majority of all the back of, back of house system as well. So HR, ordering, uh, inventory, all those kinds of things. That's all my code. And then the back end systems running at Little Caesars headquarters, that's pretty much entirely my software as well. And even though I haven't worked for them for four years, they're still using all of that. So anyway. Um, I kind of, yeah, like I say, I've kind of worked in every industry. I've sold software over the internet for years. I sold backup software late 90s, two th early 2000s. It was software that was used by the U.S. government and HP, IBM, um, the Department of Defense, a bunch of different, bunch of different uh, entities, well-known entities, used my backup software for, for years and years. So, all right, um, let's see. What character generator are you using since the building graphics are limited? So again, I use my own software for that. It's the same software that I mentioned a few minutes, a few minutes ago when somebody was asking me about doing songs or, or Bible references or whatever. So I have one piece of software. Just enter the text, and it generates a nice looking graphic. So very quick, very easy. We're able to generate graphics on the fly using that. So you just put in the text you want, and it generates everything for you. OK. You use the camera on location connected via internet stream, RTSP, or maybe some provider. We've done uh, two years ago when we did the Fourth of July event. We had some remote cameras. Um, so part of that event, they they walked the flag up this road a couple miles long, and we wanted to have. They started a, 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 cer a cemetery, and they wanted to have video footage from there. So in that case, we handed the camera operators a video pro and a hotspot and streamed up to YouTube, actually. And then I had just had computers here in the trailer that were full screen with the YouTube feed. So, but there's other ways of doing that, too. You can you could use, like, uh, Skype or something like that. We just, we just did that because it was quick and easy. We had the hardware that worked for it. And it would have worked better if we had a decent cellular connection, but the cellular connectivity up there wasn't great. 
and we did re did resolve that the second year. But uh, so, okay. What is the connection of the tra camera to the trailer oak like? So I did a video about that about a month ago. So just go back in my video feed about a month, and you'll see uh, a very detailed video covering covering that. Kind of clock you're using. This clock is from Master Clock. So that's masterclock.com, and I discovered them at NAB a few years ago, uh, when most of those kind of clocks are like over two thousand dollars. I was excited to find one that was only five hundred. So, but it's powered over Ethernet, so it's not actually plugged in to the power up here. It's being powered over the Ethernet cable coming from the back. So, uh, it actually synchronizes time over the internet. So you just put in address of NTP server, and it does its thing. So. Okay, intrinsic, giving a nice plug on CareAxis, always appreciated. So, yeah, CareAxis.com, the website I created for managing video production businesses. Let's see, what is the name of the pad you use with Black, black Magic to change cameras? So that was the X-Keys, that's the XK128, or XKE128, and I have an 80 key as well, which we'll see in a minute when we get to the audio booth. What language do you use, language and libraries do you use for, soft, for custom software? So for a long time I used Delphi, but in the last four years I've been doing pretty much everything on the desktop in C Sharp, and then on the web I use PHP and JavaScript, obviously uh, HTML, CSS, those kinds of things. So I've used, in 40 in some odd years, I've used a lot of different languages. Um, but uh, that's, those are kind of my current tools. All right. We need to need to move on a little bit, so I start covering some of what's going on over here. So this this desk here on the side is probably the least used part of the trailer, but it's designed for graphics to be created here. Uh, normally this Mac isn't used for that; it's just that just happened to be a good place to store it, so that's why it's sitting there. But we normally have a laptop sit, sitting here that's producing the, any character graphics that we need. So uh, so graphics take place here. Very often what that means is we either put the, the graphic feed on this monitor or up here on this monitor, uh, in this quadrant of this monitor. We can go either way because I have total flexibility in signal routing here. I can put things wherever that makes sense. So it doesn't always make sense to do it down here because the laptop kind of covers some of that screen and it would make it hard to see lower thirds, but I can do that. Uh, I've, con I've, put, I've considered the idea of actually having a dedicated computer here at this station, but I, it hasn't really been. Too, too pressing in order to make that happen. Um, next to this station, we have the station for controlling the pan tilt zoom cameras, and that's why there's an Xbox controller here. I, I wrote software to use the Xbox controller to control the PTZ cameras. Um, they can control well as many as you want. I have two cameras, uh, and the video from those two cameras would show up up here on this monitor, and then the software to control would show up down here on this monitor, but I can also reverse those as well when need be. Uh, because these sources are flexible, I can stick anything I want up here. Uh, right now I've got uh, the multi-view from the ATEM switcher in the upper left and then program feed in the upper right, but again, I can stick anything I want in any, any of those uh, as well. Um, so underneath the desk right here is an Ultra Studio 4K from Blackmagic, and that's connected to th this MacBook over Thunderbolt. Uh, I've also connected it to a, my Dell laptop as well. Works just fine. The Dell uh, Thunderbolt 3, and this is a Thunderbolt 2 device, but I have a little converter, and it works just fine. A few months back, I added desk drawers. And they're all messy, but it's been great to have a place to store things, get them off the desks, and just sort of neaten things up a little bit. So there's that. Um, most of the stations have a dedicated computer aside from PTZ, or sorry, CG right here, and those use Bluetooth keyboards and mice for the most part. Um, I use Bluetooth because they have longer range, it has longer range than your traditional USB type wireless. Um, so those, that's actually worked out great. Um, moving back just a little bit farther, this whole section back here, you might want to trade places with. <laughs> um, is engineering. So this is where all the equipment lives. There we go. And this is where I can monitor all the signals and everything that are going on. So let's switch places here. 
So, yeah, so like a monitor for the computer that's for the station, and then a monitor. Right now it's showing multi view, but again, I can, I can stick anything I want there. And then the equipment rack itself. And it's getting rather warm in here, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, I can't read comments at the moment, so I'll have, have to come back to comments in a, in a bit. All right, so just I'm going to run through the equipment fairly quickly. I have videos for um, most of the equipment that's here, starting in the top, just a, kind of a generic power switch, and then a Blu-ray player, and then a video patch panel, which I did a video on a month ago. Ethernet, HDMI, and fiber connections, and then a panel of just Ethernet connections. And then this is a 52-port gigabit switch, managed switch from TP-Link. Um, and then coming down a little farther, we have the actual router. This is a Edge Router X from Ubiquity. And it's also where my Video Pro is, which is doing the encoding for this video. And then a HyperDeck Studio Pro, a Terranex Express, uh, Blackmagic MultiView 4, so at least three of them, I have more than that. Blackmagic Studio Converter, which does all the fiber conversion. I need to probably to mute that. There we go. So this does all the fiber conversion. Um, so the fiber is coming from the camera, converts to SDI. And then the Smart Video Hub for routing all the video sources within the trailer. The computers for the various stations throughout, and then the, the server. Uh, this is actually the computer that we not just store stuff on, but it actually has Premiere on it. And when we do editing, this is a computer that actually does that. Come down a little farther. There's normally a Smart Scope Duo here, right? Now, but right now I've got it temporarily at the front desk. And this is actually my video switcher itself. So this is the ATEM 2ME Production Studio 4K. So this produces two separate programs simultaneously. Uh, I can handle um, up to 20 video sources and produce two final mixes. Uh, which you can use for layers or to do, produce two separate programs at the same time. And I've got another smart video hub 40 by 40 for routing video signals. Uh, there are, I want to say about 10 lines, 10 or 12 lines running between these two video hubs. So I'm able to share signals back and forth between the switcher and the equipment in the trailer. Come down a little farther, a couple of HyperDeck Studio Minis, and then one of the Terranex Mini SDI to HDMI converters, and then another studio converter for converting fiber. So between those two, that gives me eight channels of uh, video over fiber, plus I have two additional uh, the sm of the smaller optical fiber converters as well. So I, I've got 10 channels of fiber coming in and out of the trailer. Come down a little farther, and this is where we get into the intercom equipment. So I have a Behringer Ultramatch Pro. So this is the unit that actually does conversion between AES and, uh, and analog audio. So someone asked me that question earlier. So this is connected with a 75 ohm cable to the studio converters, which th themselves are con interconnected using the same sort of 75 ohm cable. Then I have a headphone amplifier. So this eight channels of amplification, which go to the various stations throughout the trailer. And then I have Behringer XR16. Uh, that's from the X Air series of audio mixers, and that's doing the, all the uh, mixing of signals for uh, the intercom. So, I'll have audio coming from all the different intercom stations throughout the trailer, or all of the different stations throughout the trailer, and then outputs um, as well. So, and then down at the bottom is some HyperDeck Studio Minis and a MultiView 16 from Blackmagic. That's the equipment meant for doing the. Uh, instant replay, uh, slow motion. So it's actually not even hooked up at the moment, but that's what that, that's what that equipment is for. All right, so maybe we gotta check in some questions here. All right, so a lot of, I threw a lot of them have scrolled off. So Matt is asking what car I used to pull the trailer. I have a Honda Ridgeline pickup. Um, it's a little underpowered for pulling the trailer, but it works. So, okay, let's see. Could you switch on the graphic system? Uh, unfortunately, there's, there's one connection that's not working right. So, unfortunately, I can't really demonstrate that very well for you here. All right. Okay. All right. Looks like I'm actually caught up on comments. All right. So, uh, with the camera reversed, I'll, I'll show you a little more of what's going on over here. So, 
when I'm shooting my YouTube videos, uh, I use the, the trailer as my set. And you guys who watch the channel are familiar with that. Uh, initially, I hadn't thought about that much, and I hadn't really designed it super well to handle that. But over time, I've made some adaptations. Like the first thing that I did was install a monitor here. So when I'm sitting in the chair, I can actually see what's going on. Because otherwise, all the monitors are facing the wrong direction. So I typically show one of the multi-views from the switcher on this monitor. Although, again, any signal I want, I could put program on there, or I could put a computer, a display from a computer on there, whatever I want. Uh, the next modification I did was dedicated lighting. So I've got a 60-watt LED light here. And then there's a 30-watt LED light here. And then there's another 30-watt LED light up over the monitors uh, used as a hair or rim light, or in my case, a bald light, right? So, um, so yeah, so dedicated lighting just for the YouTube videos. Um, and I need that much lighting because the camera that I use is the Micro Studio 4K from Blackmagic. And even with the, gr the gain cranked all the way to, to 12 decibels, the maximum, the aperture opened all the way up. It required that much light in order to get a usable image. Um, at some point, I'll do a demonstration video for you guys. Um, so you can see just how insensitive to light this is compared to the other cameras that I use. But it's set up here more or less permanently. I mean, if I can pull, I can pull it down if I need to for an event. But I found that these cameras just don't gather enough light for most of the events that we shoot. So it got repurposed as the camera for my YouTube videos. So, all right. Uh, someone asking what capture card I use for streaming. Um, so when I need to do capture in the computer, I use the DeckLink or an Ultra Studio. But I don't use I don't use don't use computers for streaming. I do all the streaming with the Video Pro. Um, I like having dedicated hardware. Uh, it, it seems to work better than using software to do live streaming so all right so awesome guy asking who's running the camera that's that's witty film girl witting Hi. witting room <laughs> been working uh, with wit a lot for about a year a little over a year uh, and she comes actually works here out of the trailer she does a lot of her editing here in the trailer um, since i can do my editing inside the trailer doesn't get used a lot when i'm not producing events and so she comes and works in the trailer so how's it work out for you wit Yeah, you get more monitors here in the trailer than you would typically have for, for editing. So, yes. all right. Okay, Newsfan77 asking if my character generator software is available for purchase. It, it's currently not. It doesn't have enough fit and, and finish, not enough polish for me to consider selling it. That's kind of the reason I haven't sold a lot of the software that I've written. It's just not polished enough for an end user. Um, you know, having written software that's been sold and used in uh, corporate environments for years and years and years. I kind of have a feel for what it takes to write software. It's not going to require a ton of support, and I just haven't put that kind of effort into those pieces of software. So, um, yeah. So, okay. Looks like we're here. Oh, it's another question. How big is the crew on an average gig? All right. So, there's no such thing as average, right? But uh, fairly typical, we'll have three camera operators on six cameras. So what that usually means is three cameras on tripods, one camera that's kind of a fixed wide shot, wide angle shot, and and then two PTZ cameras. And so that gives me a lot of different a angles that I can use and yet uh, still allows me to, to be able to afford a crew. So Utah is very, very price sensitive. And so I have to be very careful not to overdo it on the size of my crew for most events. Otherwise, I'll price myself out of the market. But uh, three is fairly typical. So that allows us to do um, a show affordably and produce a pretty polished um, looking result. So we have had events where we've had up to eight cameras with, no, sorry, up to 11 cameras with a crew. I think we probably had 10 people on that crew. So we had four people in the trailer, and then, yeah, the 11 cameras, only one of which was unmanned. So whatever that works out to. So we've, we've gone, we've gotten pretty good, pretty good size uh, when I need to. So Felipe is thanking you for running the camera with. So. You're welcome. <laughs> Do you want to show the back? Yeah, we'll get there. Okay. 
Uh, someone asking where Mr. Green is, where, where Paul is. Uh, I haven't seen Paul in a little while. With coronavirus stuff going on, a lot of us have kind of walked down a little bit. Wit's here working all the time, so I mean, if she was sick, I would have been sick a long time ago, and vice versa. <laughs> um, so, uh, Mac AV commenting that I hope you have good schematics for fault finding. I do actually. Um, I'll, I'll, I, can, I can show you that briefly. So, uh, Matt asking where I store the tray where not in use. What security do you have? Those are th two things that I do not talk about in public. So, I, I'm sure you understand why. Uh, let's see. How do you control the temperature in the trailer? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that would be a real nice thing to be able to run that right now. But uh, there's an air conditioner up here, and it's it's uh, got enough BTUs that it can keep up when it, on a hot day, uh, but it's not so beefy that it can cool down the trailer when it's already hot on a hot day. So. I kind of have to sort of plan ahead a little bit, so turn on the, the air conditioner a few hours before an event without the equipment running, and then I can bring it down to a comfortable temperature, and from there it's able to maintain a comfortable, tem comfortable temperature even when it's 100 degrees or hotter outside. So um, in the winter, the equipment generates enough heat that it stays comfortable inside. In fact, sometimes during the winter we even have to open up the back door in order to let some of the heat out. So. Okay, say asking if I have announcers. Uh, I don't personally. There's a company that I work with from time to time that hires hires announcers. So, so sort of, I guess. Um, how am I handling IFB? Okay, so I don't have, I don't necessarily have dedicated IFB. So uh, for those that are unfamiliar, IFB is basically a way to talk to on-air talent during an event. Um, I don't have dedicated hardware for that, but I do have capability for, for handling that. So I have in-ear monitors that I can use. Uh, the audio mixer that I have here can be used to generate things. The, the intercom mixer that I have can also be used to generate an IFB feed. So I've got plenty of options without having to have dedicated IFB equipment. So, Okay, let's see. What is the name of the pad you use with Blackmagic to change your cameras? I've answered that a couple times. That's the X-Keys, XK128, and I also have an 80. Yep. It's made by PI Engineering. Yep. Uh, yep. So we got, we got that covered. All right. So caught up on questions again. So I think we can move back to the audio booth now. And this is actually my favorite part of the trailer. I got started in audio long before I started doing video. And so I'm really very much an audio guy. Are you going to be able to see me with that light? I need to grab the light. A little dark. Okay, so the heart of the audio booth, it's a little messy. We were, just, we were actually just shooting a thing for Wit here a little while ago. I haven't cleaned up from that yet. But the heart of the audio booth is the Yamaha TF3 mixer. So this is, it's a 40 channel, 40 channel plus. It has 40 inputs, um, some analog, some digital only. Uh, plus stereo feeds and returns and those kinds of things. But it's Dante based and I do audio over Dante. Uh, I, I love being able to send audio over the same cable that I send all my other traffic, all my other data. So I don't have to run dedicated separate audio. Um, so it has 24 faders plus the master. Uh, of course they're all motorized so as I select between different banks you see the faders move around. Um, it's got really good sound quality. I, I've been really impressed with the sound quality on this mixer. Uh, definitely cleaner than the other mixers I've used in the past. Uh, I'm able to build as many mixes as I need. It has 20 aux channels, so theoretically build 20 channels plus the main feed. Plus it has matrix outputs as well, so I can really do pretty much anything that I need here. The only thing that this doesn't have built into it that I would really like would be dedicated delay lines on each channel. But I'm not generally doing such fancy audio that I need to have delay lines just for that purpose. So this is a pretty good fit. And one of the, one of the requirements for putting an audio mixer in a trailer is that it has to fit, has to physically fit. And um, this mixer was just the right footprint to be able to fit in the trailer and, and not take up too much room. Um, hooked to the Yamaha mixer are my Genelec monitors. These things are amazing. I guess you can see the one on the right a little better. Uh, these are 8010A, I think. So it's the 3-inch 
three inch version of the Genelec monitors. They sound amazing. And they would be a little better with a subwoofer, but they, ha they do have a surprisingly good bass response, even for their tiny size. And they are plenty loud. Even with the air conditioner running, you can, all, you can definitely hear the audio coming through the Genelecs. Um, and the, the advantage you get with something like at this level compared to some less expensive monitors is that you just hear every little detail. So a lot of things that might be going on in the background you, you wouldn't be able to hear on other speakers are very clearly audible on these. Of course, they have a pretty flat frequency response, so you don't have to worry about any specific frequencies being exaggerated. Uh, but they, they sound great. I really like them. Um, behind those, you can see that I've got a monitor. That's a, this is a 4K monitor as well. Right now I've got it coming from a MultiView 4. So what you're seeing there is preview feed, program feed in the upper left and right, and then the two MultiViews coming from the Blackmagic switcher on the bottom. Uh, but again, those are all fully routable. So um, I, Occasionally, if I need to be in the back doing graphics and audio, I'll stick the graphics up on one of those upper upper quadrants. Um, so it's awesome being able to just route signals as flexibly as I need to. Moving up, uh, and just kind of an I.O. panel there, so power for a monitor, uh, task lighting, can turn that on and off there. A USB connection from the server. Right now I've got X, key, X keys controller plugged into that. Some just generic SDI video connections, um, microphone for for the intercom, so uh, audio, a new person doing audio can talk to the inter people in intercom. Um, moving above there, we have, this is another Blackmagic Design Smart Scope Duo, so it's showing program feed and then audio associated with the program feed, so I can monitor levels and monitor the phase of the signals to make sure that I don't have any weird phase issues going on, so yeah. Moving up from there, I have another Behringer Eurorack uh, RX1602 mixer, like the one in the front. And that just combines various audio sources for these monitors, which include uh, the Yamaha mixer, also a dedicated output from the compressor, and a dedicated output from the video switcher as well. So I can turn those on and off. Additionally, there's also a connection to the intercom. So if the person sitting here in audio booth wants to hear what's going on with the intercom, you can turn that on and listen in on that as well. Moving up, a couple of AKG wireless microphone receivers, one of which is what I'm using right now, so you're able to hear me. A couple of audio patch bays from Neutrik. And then I have a combination CD player slash MP3 player, so it accepts USB thumb drives. And then above that, kind of the unit that does a lot of the magic for live streaming. And this is a Behringer Ultradyne Pro. It's a six-band uh, compressor, so multi-band compressor. And that's really what helps keep the audio levels in check for live streaming. It's, it's especially important when you're dealing with live streaming that your audio levels are nice and consistent. Uh, I guess a lot of people are listening on devices like phones that don't have great speakers. You want to make sure that things don't get too quiet, so they have to turn it up or too loud and distort on those tiny speakers. So that unit constantly monitors audio level and then tweaks the levels within six separate frequency bands so that the compression that's being applied is actually pretty pretty much inaudible. Above that just a little power conditioner and then above that we have connections for the antennas on the roof. Uh, basically a patch bay for those so I can reroute which allows me to use the antennas on the roof for the wireless microphones or I can use it to transmit to an in-ear monitor system or in some cases uh, if I need to, I've got uh, a police scanner if I need to listen on other radio bands. Uh, I can plug that in there as well. Uh, so a lot of different options. So it's nice having those set up in that way. And notice on the wall, I've got racks for hanging the patch cables. And there's one on this side, and there's one on the opposite side as well. So TRS connections on one side, and XLRs on the other. So. Um, Computer display down here, like like most of the computer displays in the trailer, it's actually a touch screen. So if I wanted to switch, run the switcher from here, I can. But I also at the moment have my XK80 X keys controller set up right here. Um, so we're doing again, we're doing a live stream for Wit a little bit while ago, a little while ago, and I was controlling the switcher from back here at the audio booth. So it's always great having that flexibility, being able to do any job from anywhere, 
and I switch and direct from the audio booth more times than you'd ever imagine. There's a lot of events where uh, we just don't have a big enough crew to have somebody specifically sitting in the audio booth separate from the director. And if it's something that's very audio centric, like a concert or whatever, I will set up here in the back uh, to do my directing from back here occasionally as well. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen from time to time. So it, it's great. Love having that flexibility. So, all right, so we check in, see if there's any more questions. I'm sure there's going to be. <laughs> test wit skills walking backwards. <laughs> Let's try not to step on her cable here. All right, so, um, yeah, looks like a few questions scrolled off. Looks like somebody's asking about the weight of the trailer. I haven't put it on a scale. Uh, empty, it was 2,300 pounds. I'm guessing it's probably around 4,000 pounds now. So, uh, Brandon, I like the t uh, TR series, probably, probably in TF. Um, Asking if the console was a little too slow to work with. It's, it's a little sluggish, but it's not bad. Uh, I don't mind it. Um, compared to its fancier, faster siblings, the QL and the CL series, it's uh, a th less than a third of the price. Actually, less than a fifth of the price. So it's one of the sacrifices that I'm willing to make. So um, Okay, yeah, so someone asking about the cost of the trailer. So yeah, so yeah, the, the mixer that I have in the trailer is the Yamaha TF3. I also have a. Okay, we'll switch. Switch out. I had another one handy. Just bear with us. It had 20%. Yeah, I don't ever believe it. <laughs> okay, we'll be back up here in a second. So. Yeah, that's one of the downsides of using the, these little X70 cameras. The batteries just don't last very long. Okay, looks like we're back. Okay, so yeah, so I have the TF3 in the trailer, and then I also have a Yamaha TF1 that I'll use in a venue. Um, because they're Dante, they can share channels. So any channels, any audio sources that are connected to the TF1 in the venue are also available to TF3 in the trailer, and vice versa. Um, I also, in addition to that, I have a couple of the 1608, the TO 1608D stage boxes. So in total, I can have what, 16, 16, 16, so 48 input channels in the venue and have all that come into the trailer over the Ethernet connection using Dante. So, okay, use house, house power for the trailer. Yes, I, I try to as whenever I can. Do I have any Blackmagic design tattoos? No. <laughs> I have a lot of Blackmagic design equipment. Uh, not that I'm necessarily married to them, but they offer a good value for equipment that does a pretty good job. So that's kind of why, um, that's kind of why I use them for a lot of things. I, 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 do, I do have other brands that I use for other things. I mean, obviously, I don't use Blackmagic cameras, um, but I just um, I use whatever the best product is for my needs. You know, I, I'm operating in a budget space in a, in a market that's very price sensitive, so I have to be careful about what what equipment that I buy. So, all right. Um, so yeah, Mario is asking if I bought the Yamaha Dante stage box. Yes, I have two of the, the TO 1608Ds. So, um, Joshua Freeman mentioning X-Key software is terrible, so I'm referring to the Just Macro software. Yes, it is terrible. It's not stable. It does like to crash. Um, I have just kind of had to work through that, so I kind of keep an eye on it. If, when I'm doing a critical event, I always make sure I have a window open on the computer next to me so that I can switch there temporarily if the if the software does crash. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen periodically. So, All right, so I've noticed any latency issues with Dante when network, network traffic is high. No, actually not. Um, part of the reason for that is my Dante traffic is on its own separate VLAN, and I've set the, the priority of that VLAN to be as high as possible. So all my Dante traffic takes precedence over everything else on my network. So I've never had a dropout, never had any sort of um, no, 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 no noise, no anything. It's always worked absolutely flawlessly. Okay, let's see which piece of equipment is responsible for sending the signal to the internet stream. Right now, I'm using the Teradek VDU Pro V I D I U. It's okay. Um, main reason I stick with it is because most of the other decent solutions out there require monthly subscriptions, and I'd rather not get into that if I if I can avoid it. So, what what are my thoughts on the new Tech TriCaster? Um, TriCasters are interesting. They're computer-based switchers, so 
Basically what they're doing is they have a capture card that brings the video in and then they use software to do all the processing on the video, which allows a lot of flexibility for a relatively affordable cost. But on the downside, the downside to that is that you've got a fair amount of latency associated with that. So every time you capture a frame of video, you have to capture the entire frame of video before it gets passed over to the software, which means that your latency coming out of your switcher is at a minimum at least two frames. If you're shooting at 30 frames per second with a camera that has a latency of one or two frames on a projector that has a latency of four or five frames, that adds up and it gets to the point where if you're doing iMag, uh, the latency is such that there's a lot of delay on the, on the projector. And hardware switchers are much better about handling that. So I don't inherently have anything against the TriCasters for a lot of different uses, but if you're doing having to do iMag, um, there's probably a better way to go. So, uh, Media asking what keypad I recommend for Blackmagic A10 Television Studio HD. If you got the budget, get the Blackmagic one. If you don't, um, you can look into Bit Focus Companion with, uh, forget the name of it, Little Control. I have one. Um, I forget. Somebody, somebody will mention it in the, in the comments. But yeah, the Bit Focus Companion software with, with the, the USB controller. So, new tech, are, new tech switchers are a little bit expensive compared to Blackmagic. So, yeah. And yes, I also, I was, and someone saying they're anticipating upgrades to the 2ME. Uh, yes, that would be nice. It would be nice to have scalers on, on these switchers. Um, I've been able to get by without though. So the cameras that I use let me output whatever format that I want. And so I don't have to worry about, about those. Um, and then I have some uh, Decimator Design MDHXs and MD Cross for converting formats otherwise. So. Thoughts on vMix? It's the same as the NewTek uh, TriCaster, so it's, it's also a software-based switcher, so you have, you have potential lati latency issues as well. So, Stream Deck, yes, thank you. <laughs> awesome guy. Thank, yeah, I knew, I knew that somebody would, would, uh, uh, would bring that up. So, all right, so, so all right, we've got someone thanking me for doing the channel. Uh, glad to do it, for the most part. I don't love being in front of a camera, but... Uh, I know that there's a lot of people out there that need this information, and I have the background, the experience, and knowledge to share, so I'll do it. So, all right. Let's see, somebody commenting on light. Do we not have enough light? Are we okay? I think we're all right. Yeah, it's not ideal, but it works. If I go over here, it's going to be way worse. <laughs> um, okay, have you ever provided a stream for some kind of webinar? Yes, uh, I have. Um, interaction with the, with the audience, live audience. I, I think I've done that one or two times. We used to use Skype for that. And so I set up a computer with Skype and then have the output of Skype go, go into the switcher. That, that works well enough. You have to have somebody that's wrangling the, those calls, though. So, uh, Okay, so I'm asking how the lockdown has affected production. So for the first month, actually, after we started having some lockdown, th uh, things got busier because there are a lot of businesses that still needed to be able to stream and they didn't have the in internal equipment or knowledge to do that. So we, we were actually a fair amount busier there for the first few weeks, but since then things have slowed down a little bit and I haven't had an event for a couple of weeks now. Um, so, and then someone asking out when, when the lockdown will finish. It's hard to say. We've actually been pretty, I don't know. Utah has not been near as strict with our lockdown, quote-unquote lockdown, as a lot of other places. Uh, we have not had an official stay-at-home order from the state at all. Um, most of the businesses that have shut down here are doing so voluntarily, not not because they're legally required to do so. Um, so, I mean, things have definitely slowed down. There's no question about that. There's less traffic, you know, uh, all the other things that you typically associate with a lot of people working from home. But... Uh, Life hasn't changed near as much here as it has a lot of other places. You know, as, as I talk to members of my family and some of the people that I work with, their life is very different for them. As for me, who typically works from home, it hasn't really changed a whole lot. So, yeah. So other people mentioning it in the comments as well that they're seeing seeing a, some additional work and then slowing down. So, yeah, it's it's probably going to be a while before we get back to some sense of normality but we're kind of in a good position though that we're providing we're able to provide a service for people who want to take things online 
because uh, you know a lot of businesses need that right now. So, so Aaron asking what you think the long terms of COVID-19 will be on the life production industry. Uh, it's probably actually going to be good for us. You know, um, a lot of live events, uh, which may have typically only had an audience in the past, may go online only. So, so yeah. Okay, so someone asking about the schematics. So, okay, so my schematics aren't technically schematics, but what I have at the different sta uh, stations in the trailer is a list of the connections that are relevant for that particular one. So this is the, these are the ones for engineering, and then I've got separate ones for audio. You can see there a list of all the different audio connections as well. Um, so it makes it really easy to troubleshoot where signals come in, are coming from and go to. Um, I'll, I have everything pretty well labeled in the trailer as well, so pretty much any place a, a, cable, a cable is connected, it's labeled with what it is. So even the cables that are in the back of the rack, they have labels on them as well, saying what they're for. So, uh, so yeah, so I don't have schematics, but I do have diagrams showing how the signals are routed within the trailer. So. Okay, what's the next upgrade for the trailer? Uh, I'm not sure what the next big one's going to be. I've been doing a lot of upgrades on the power systems the last little while. So just yesterday, I was actually redid a bunch of the big 12 volt wires in the front. Uh, not because there was anything necessarily wrong with what was there before, but as I move forward, I want to have better monitoring of some of the power, which meant that I had to disconnect some of the connections that were consolidated into one, separate them out. So I've been working on that. Uh, I don't know. I haven't really put a whole lot of thought into it. I'm, I keep a spreadsheet of list of equipments that I want to, a list of equipment upgrades that I want to do. Um, none of it, on, nothing on that spreadsheet is super high priority at the moment. So, um, yeah. Okay. I think people will be s sick of watching things online. Well, we may not have a choice. <laughs> You know, it's going to be, we're not going to see big public events until there's a vaccine for COVID-19. So we're going to be, we're going to see more online stuff for a while, I think. So do you use a specific brand model of live casting solutions if a Wi-Fi inf infrastructure isn't available? So as mentioned previously, I use a Teradek VDU Pro and it typically goes through whatever internet connection I happen to be using at the trailer and at the time. But I can also bond, uh, pair with a, a cell phone or hotspot in addition to that as well. And that's always been more than enough bandwidth in order to do a stream. So that, that works well. Did I ever find a solution for commentators over Dante? Yes, I have looked at a number of them. I think, I think it was you, MacAV, that actually commented on a couple options in one of my last live streams. So I haven't decided for sure which one I'm going to go with. But uh, there were a couple that were suggested in my last video that I looked at, looked at and liked. Um, so, yeah. I, I haven't had a need for that. We haven't had any sporting events in a while, but uh, so that's kind of the direction we're going. Have I thought about moving to Ursa broadcast cameras instead of Sony's? Uh, not seriously. Uh, I think if I'm going to move to a higher quality camera, I'm, and I'm not even sure that those are higher quality cameras than what I'm using, uh, I'll probably go with a more conventional chain, camera chain from Sony. Uh, I, have, I haven't investigated that in a while. It's Hasn't, it just hasn't been necessary, and uh, I don't have the revenue to justify replacing all of that anyway. So, all right. So, would you recommend studio technologies uh, for commentators? I like the studio technologies product I was looking at. So, so okay. How much of your crew is stationed in the trailer? So, for most events, the overwhelming majority of events, it is just me in the trailer. Um, when we do have budget to bring someone else on. I will try to bring on a director and have somebody else do the directing. That way I can focus on audio. Um, so in that case, typically two. But we have had a number of events where we've had as many as five in the trailer at once. So typically we'll add somebody for graphics. We'll add somebody for PT PTC camera control. And then if we ever do sporting events again, then we'll have the instant replay for that as well. So.
All right, so let's see. I'd be curious if I have plans to go further with Dante, specifically video networking. We'll see. I mean, the, the Dante AV stuff is still kind of still kind of new. So um, Hugo asking if I showed the outside. I have not, and I try not to show the outside of the trailer uh, online. So other than cost, why choose a PlayStation controller over PTZ controllers? Uh, well, it's actually an Xbox controller, but the main thing is being able to do a lot of things with, with that that I can't do with others. Like, for example, the software that I wrote has the ability to record a move. So if I want to do this cool sweeping move where I do this sort of thing, I can record that and with a single button play that back. And most of the PTZ controllers that are out there don't do that. Uh, so, What solutions recommend for streaming to multiple platforms at once? Uh, there's a bunch of them out there. I used Joycaster once upon a time. I didn't particularly like that. When I needed to do it, I actually just used Teradex Sharewing because it works with the equipment that I have. But there are tons of, tons of solutions. Maybe somebody in the comments can actually chime in and, and say what, uh, what services they've liked for streaming to multiple locations at once. Hacking Hollywood asking if I've had projects with teleprompters. There have been some. It's been a while. Uh, I have my own prompter that I built, which does work on my on my tripods. It's pretty fairly lightweight. It works with the cameras that I have, and the same software that I use for doing graphics actually does teleprompter features as well. And it uses the Xbox controller for controlling it. Okay. All right, asking if I use DSTI for sports. I haven't had to do that so so far. I would love to do that. I just haven't gotten gotten uh, that far down that path. How many PTZs do I have in my workflow? I own two. Um, at some point, I will be getting an additional one. The Sony finally introduced some affordable 4K models uh, recently, so I'll, I'll probably add one of those to my arsenal before too long. The one thing I don't like about a lot of those cameras is they don't have super, super slow motion on them. Uh, the ones that I bought can go as slow as 0.1 degrees per second, and they, also, and they have a 30 times optical zoom. So even though they require a lot of light, they're pretty flexible. So I can, I can stick a camera way in the back of the room and still get a nice, smooth, s smooth slow zoom, or, or nice, nice, nice slow pan at the front of the room. So, Okay. Um, Asking if I have another engineer that can help. Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, I have a good friend who would, would do well at that, uh, a guy named Brad that I used to be roommates with years ago. He would be amazing at it, but he's, I haven't had the need and we haven't had the budget to bring on two people. So, um, yeah, and someone else mentioned the S. Yes, one of the reasons using the Xbox controller, there are a lot of people that are familiar with how to use the Xbox controller instead of getting a dedicated PTZ controller. It's very natural for a lot of people. They just, just use it. Okay, do I have a NAS in the trailer? No, I use actually use the server. I have multiple hard drives in the server and just use Windows file sharing with that. Okay, restream I.O. is pretty good. Okay, we want to vote for that. How many of my current gigs could be done with a small portable live switcher versus the trailer? Um, well, some of them could, but they wouldn't necessarily be as well done. The biggest problem is audio. Um, it's hard to get good quality audio with a small switcher, especially if you need to, need to maintain that constant audio level. So that um, multi-band compressor I have in the back is, it's, it really makes a huge difference. And like any time I have to use my small switcher setup without that, the audio quality really, really suffers quite a bit. So, okay, if Blackmagic put out a PTZ cam like Studio Mini, it would be a game changer. Yeah, maybe. I I'm still not a huge fan of the Blackmagic cameras. So, you die in wit. <laughs> it's just hot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very hot, it's very warm in here. It's 88 degrees in here at the moment, so. All right, so I'm going to turn on the air conditioner, which is going to make it a little odd, like a little loud, but we are oh great. Uh, <laughs> I, think we, I think somebody must have tripped a breaker. Uh, okay, so someone asking if I use any wireless comms. Um, if I need, yeah, there you go. Open up the door. Um, if I need wireless communication, I right now I'm using in-ear monitors. Um, there's the hook there. Uh, I use in-air monitors for that. Uh, since my intercom is just analog audio, it's really easy to uh, just send that feed out with an in-air monitor system. That works pretty well. Might consider doing a video if it do a graphic solution. Uh, maybe, yeah. I, I, I did a demonstration of it in one of my live streams, I want to say a year ago. 
it was brief and it was kind of somewhere in the middle, but but there, yeah, it was there. So D Media also asking about text overlay. Yeah, same thing. It's a custom software that I worked. So and then ever work with remote video feeds, RTMP are being sent to your tree. Uh, again, I mentioned I answered that a little while ago. So uh, I ha when I've had to do that, I will typically actually use YouTube and just do a low latency stream to YouTube and then pull it down in the trailer. So, how many tracks would you have to mix for a concert when you use the house feed mix? Okay, so one big problem with doing the house feed mix, um, it always sounds not right for a number of reasons. Like for example, in a live environment, the drums, even if they're mic'd, they're usually very, very low in the house mix because the drums tend to be very loud in person. Uh, the other issue is venues always have some sort of ambient reverb and that doesn't come across in the house feed. Um, the needs for audio for a live stream are actually very different than the, the, live, than the feed for, for the house audio, the PA system. So whenever I can, if at all possible, I will build a separate mix in the trailer. And on occasions when I can't, I will at a minimum, at a very minimum, set up some ambient mics in order to get some of the natural sound of the room or the audience reaction or something like that and then mix that into the house feed. But uh, with so many venues in the area going to Dante, it's really easy for me to pull in all their individual isolated channels in the trailer. So I just plug in my Dante equipment or plug in my Dante network into theirs and I've got access to all of their stuff. So. And sometimes I pull from the house feed and then just add to it from on top of that. But generally speaking, I will try and build a separate mix whenever I possibly can. Okay, let's see. Doing audio separately for the stream while another audio engineer might be mixing for the live event. We, we have done that. Quite often the budget doesn't allow us to hire two sound guys, but we have done it before. Joshua asking if I have any videos of me and my crew doing an event. I wish. I really, really wish. Um, Wit's actually working on a promo video for me right now, and we've gone through a bunch of old footage trying to find us in action, and there just isn't much, and mostly because it really requires somebody not working the event itself to shoot the behind-the-scenes behind the behind the scenes footage, and I've just never had the, the thought or the ambition to hire somebody just to, to shoot the behind-the-scenes stuff. So, uh, yeah. I've got Hacking Hollywood talking about Wirecast and OBS. Uh, I don't use those, so I can't really make any comments on it. Um, for replays, what do I use? Uh, when I actually need to do that, I'll be using my own custom software to handle that. So, uh, Hacking Hollywood asking if I'm shooting anything next week. It's going to be an Alpine nearby. Um, I don't have anything going on next week, so my calendar is empty for some time at this point with things things shut down so so it's backup streaming encoder uh, if I need to have a separate backup streaming encoder at that point I will use some software running on either this MacBook Pro or another computer sitting here bring video in via the Ultra Studio that I have under the desk so do I use secondary streams generally not uh, I, I can't say that I've never done that but uh, yeah and then Marco, I've answered the answer replay question a couple times now. All right. Um, did we show everything? Uh, yeah, we haven't, we haven't really covered the storage. There's nothing super, super exciting and visual to see. I'm going to grab this light so I can see a little better. So the top storage here, this is actually mostly lighting. So these are all LED lights on that shelf. Likewise, all these down here. So I carry a fair amount of lighting on board because uh, very often venues are kind of lacking in that area. So there's that, and then up top got some cable protectors and light stands and some other things up there. Uh, coming down a little farther, this shelf is almost all audio gear, and it's all in cases, you can't see it, but wireless microphones in these cases. There's random junk in there. The, and the two shelves below are almost all just cables. So like my fiber cables are in there, audio cables are there beside it, and then moving a little farther this other direction, that's where we get into networking and uh, power connections and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, almost all the storage is 
lighting and cabling uh, with some microphones in there as well. So, yeah, the storage isn't super, super exciting, but uh, uh, other than that, and as mentioned earlier, the cameras themselves are actually stored under the front desk. There is actually a bit, quite a bit of storage under the audio desk. I'm not, I'm not going to pull all that stuff out, but that's where I keep my, my stage boxes and I have my fly pack for my video switcher fly pack under there, under there and more wireless microphones is there. It's, I've kind of gotten over, gone overboard. I probably have 40 channels of wireless mics, something along those lines. So, yeah. So, hacking mentioning that uh, the carpet finished off the trailer. Yes. Yeah, the carpet made a huge difference when I finally got that installed. So. Eric said he has a budget to become a patron. That's awesome. Very much appreciated. Uh, it would be nice if I had more patrons so I could actually buy more equipment for review. But uh, I understand that I have a limited audience. And a lot of you guys are on fixed budget, so I kind of understand why why the Patreon thing hasn't really taken off. So, so. Well, that, I think, covers most everything. Um, well, of much interest anyway. I mean, there's a lot of intimate details that I haven't covered here. You know, I'm not going to talk about how all the different cables are wired and everything, but uh, uh, I guess I've got a couple other questions. Would you normally record all inputs and what nature of deliverables? Edited raw footage, how long? Okay, on terms of video, we always record the isolated footage on all the cameras. Uh, and of course, always make at least two copies of the program feed, um, sometimes more. And if I have an inexperienced director, I will also record the multi-view, camera multi-view, along with intercom audio so that they can review their performance. Of course, always with their, always with their permission. Um, so then in terms of deliverables, I will provide, if the customer wants the isolated cameras, I'll give that to them. I don't charge anything for that. Uh, of course, the program feed, I almost always give it to them in ProRes if they want it. A lot of them people don't know what to do with it, so I'll just, just do an MP, an MP4. Um, audio, when I remember, which isn't always, I'll try and do isolated audio channels with that. Like having Dante allows me to re record each individual audio channel separately on the computer there in the back. Uh, so I can remix that later if need be. Uh, but I try and provide as much footage to everybody as possible. Uh, but again, most of my customers just don't even know what to do with a ProRes file. So just the MPEG-4 is good enough for them. So. MVP for wit running the cam for that long without AC. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it's really light. Yeah, I, I selected my smallest professional camera for just, just, uh, just so. OK, so how many HyperDeck Pros are you using? I only have one HyperDeck uh, Pro. I have the, seven of the my studio minis and for uh they work as both recorders and play, play playback units and asking if i use the auto start on transition when when it's appropriate yes it's not always the, the the best way to go so if i had to do it all over again what would i do differently um i probably would have designed the trailer a little bit better for editing and for uh, the YouTube videos. Uh, the layout is not perfect for those. It works, but it could have been better. Um, I would have done better ventilation, specifically for times like this. <laughs> I still might do a roof vent in this thing. I haven't decided yet. But, uh, um, yeah. How do you set up live commentators, audio-wise, compression levels, ducking, etc.? Uh, always do compression. It's very often compression that doesn't kick in until somebody gets louder than normal. Um, my mixer doesn't do ducking, so I don't really have that as an option. Uh, let's see. Someone commenting on battery dead. We didn't. My battery didn't die again, did it? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ryan asking if I license deliverables. I just turn over, over ownership. I'm, I don't. I don't work that way. So whenever I shoot something, I I always treat that content as owned by the person we're working for. So Ainsley asking what headset I use. Uh, this most of the time I use the Audio Technica BPHS1. They sound great, uh, and for the rare occasions when I need to have a commentator on camera, I'll use those for them, and then use one of my Biodynamics instead. 
So those don't sound as good, so I don't use them very often. They're kind of the backup. But when we have more than a couple people in the trailer or the audio technicas are being used for something else, then I'll break out the wire dynamics. So, all right. Um, yeah, th thanks, Ho Hacking Hollywood. Uh, I'd love to see pictures. I'd love to see pictures from anybody on any stuff that you've, that you've done. So, uh, Hugo asking what equipment I use for wireless cameras. Um, is that handy? Let me check. Not that. Yeah, that one. So, <laughs> a little crowded on space here. But my wireless system, my, my primary wireless system is this uh, Santa Gears Ghost Eye 200M. And that's worked really well. I've been very happy with it. So, transmitter and receiver uh, works really well. Runs off Sony batteries or V Lock. Uh, works, works really well. I've been very really happy with it. And then I have uh, an older system from somewhere else that I use in a pinch. But it's not great. And it's HDMI only, which I try and avoid HDMI whenever I possibly can. So, all right. How to share deliverables with a client, USB drives, Google Drive, other. Almost exclusively USB drives when they want the original footage. Um, when it's just the MPEG-4, I would actually use OneDrive, Microsoft OneDrive. So, Tudor asking if NDI is really the future. Uh, it's hard to say. I don't know if NDI specifically is. Certainly a video over IP is the future, maybe long, longer term. But yeah, I, video over IP probably is. Um, the future. So, uh, Steve Shannon asking if I ever use Tidler Live. I have not. I use my own software for titles. So, Mike asking if I do sporting events. We have done some sporting events in the past. I haven't done one in a long time. Uh, kind of funny because I one of the reasons I built the trailer specifically was because we had done some sporting events and we were set up outside and it was super frustrating not being able to see our monitors under the bright sun. We needed the an area to work that was um, had better controlled lighting, and but soon very re quickly, very quickly realized that having the trailer is awesome because all the equipment's already wired and ready to go, which means that we can uh, pull into a venue and be set up and streaming very often in an hour or less. So, DMM Tech asking what I think of SRT. Uh, I'm not familiar with that acronym. Okay, um, where did I put my water? Oh, I'll put lemonade. I'm talking for an hour and 45 minutes. How do I do RF coordination? Most of the time, I'm providing all the RF equipment, and so I just have to worry about my own needs. But in other cases, uh, just talk to work with the venue. Um, I have a spectrum analyzer that lets me see what's going on in the radio spectrum. That way I can make sure that I can put my wireless gear in space that isn't going to uh, stomp on somebody else's. Um, yeah. So, do you use house current or a generator? Um, almost exclusively house current. Um, I have a small generator that I own that I can, I can use to power the electronics, but it's not big enough to run the air conditioner. And so it hasn't, I haven't had a lot of incentive to, to try that. So, uh, and yeah, generally speaking, house current. Uh, if I need a generator for an event, um, I have a friend who owns a 7,000 watt Honda, and he lets me use it anytime I want. So that hasn't been a problem. All right. Okay. Give you guys another. Okay, SRT, secure reliable transport. Okay, yeah, I haven't used it yet. So um, I'll give you guys another like one minute to ask questions and I'm going to wrap it up. My voice is dying here and it's insanely hot in this place. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> yeah, Wit, Wit's got herself wedged into the opening of the door there so she can cool off a little bit. <laughs> uh, so, um, what percentage live to post work? Almost, we, almost everything we do goes out live. So, um, yeah, there, it's, it's kind of rare that we shoot anything that doesn't get streamed live, and that's kind of the way that the whole market is gone. So, Isaac asking if I can provide a setup diagram of a talkback system. Um, I had I did a video 
I think it was about a year ago, on how my intercom works. So go watch that, and if you have questions, ask me on the comments of the video. So it, but that video is pretty, pretty thorough. So uh, Aaron saying thanks, Doug and Wit. So you have, you have fans, Wit. <laughs> Uh, Ainsley asking, what's the name of the wireless keyboard? I assume you're talking about the this one? Or, I don't know. That one's a Logitech. It's a gaming keyboard. I got it because it has extra keys that I can program for, for editing. So, like this one toggles the clip on and off. This one cuts all the, all the clips at the current position on the playhead. I mean, it's just, yeah, it has additional customization. It's awesome. Uh, these other keyboards are almost all Microsoft wireless their bluetooth it's the uh, model 6000 i think yeah microsoft bluetooth mobile keyboard 6000 these have been great they have a great feel they last forever i think most of these i've never replaced the batteries it was, and i've had the trailer now for two and a half years so they're still running the original batteries in most cases um, they work great um, bluetooth has been far more reliable than you know, your other usb wireless options the one downside is uh, the keyboards don't work until windows boots so if i ever have to go into the BIOS of the computer. I have to plug in a, another a separate keyboard. But. All right. Um, preferred platform for live streaming. I use YouTube most of the time because most people are familiar with it. Uh, Mr. G-Man asking how I learned to, to read and use video scopes. I think most of, uh, my, my initial exposure to them was probably 20 years ago. And I had a roommate who was working professionally in video and he kind of explained to me the benefits of them and kind of taught me a little bit about them and I just kind of run with it from there. So it's a good good uh, skill to have. So yeah, another thanks for, for witty, witty Film Girl. <laughs> uh, comment on the wood surfaces. Yes, I, I didn't want to do a trailer that felt cold and industrial. I wanted to have something that felt comfortable and, you know, homey, a little bit homey. So. Did I pull it off? <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. Have I used Live U, Hero, or other 4G? No. Nope, I have not. So, another shout out to Witty. <laughs> Follow her on Instagram, Witty Film Girl. Uh, yep. Website, wittingramfilm.com. So, uh, yeah. so Playman using a similar talkback system, but instead of converting AES to analog, go from AES to Dante. That works too, so, yeah. And yet another thanks to Doug and Witt, so. Okay, guys, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up. So thanks for watching. This has been kind of a long video. Um, I know this has been one that's kind of been anticipated by a lot of people. Uh, I've made a lot of enhancements of the trailer over the years, and the videos that are out there, you'd have to watch a lot, a lot of footage in order to get the same information, and it's kind of a, a dense, dense video, so. If you have questions, feel free to ask those in the comment section. Although I've been getting so many questions that want a lot of details recently, I kind of have to ask people to make sure your questions are something that I can answer briefly. Uh, it's, things are getting a little out of control. I'm getting so many qu questions, not only on my YouTube channel, but through my website and Instagram and everything. I'm going to have to kind of do something to cut back on that a little bit. But if you have a question that I can answer quickly, f please, please feel free to ask. I'm happy to answer any of the questions that I can do so. Um, so if you're in the video production business and haven't checked out my website, crewaxis.com, please do so. And you want to get a shot of the name there and the monitor wit. So it's a website that's designed to manage all aspects of your video production business. So it keeps track of your equipment, keeps track of your crew, manages all your communication with your crew. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, schedule all your events, helps you to communicate with your clients to make sure that you have you're meeting all their needs. You have all the equipment that you need for an event and so forth. So that's just crewaccess.com. I did not set up a promotional link for this video, so you can just go directly to the website, crewaccess.com, and try it out. There's a free version of the site there. You can use for as long as you want. I'm not going to set a limitation on that. And if that meets your needs, use it, use it for forever. I don't care. That's fine. So anyway, thanks, guys, for watching, and have a fantastic day. And we'll come over here and hit the fade to black. It's not working. Okay, <laughs> we'll just cut the stream.